Welcome, brothers and sisters, to the Mormon Movie Reviews, where LDS movie lovers belong. This is our second episode, and today is August 26, 2022. Today, we're going to be reviewing The Three Witnesses, that 1963 classic. And here's a picture of The Three Witnesses, uh, some pictures of The Three Witnesses right here. These are The Three Witnesses to the Book of Mormon. Those were the ones who were allowed to see the plates and handle them with their hands. This is the movie that we're going to be reviewing here, which is The Three Witnesses. Before we get into the movie, a couple of items, um, a couple of references. First of all, you can't discuss the three witnesses unless you discuss Richard Lloyd Anderson's investigating the Book of Mormon witnesses which was published in Deseret Book in 1989. He's really a place where you need to start and end when it comes to discussing the three witnesses. He also had a couple of other books so I cannot um I can't more highly recommend him than, than this. Dan Vogel also put out a series on YouTube, which I think is very good. It's Dan Vogel's Book of Mormon Witnesses YouTube series. He delves into the three witnesses that you see there on the left. That's their statement. And also the eight witnesses statement that you see on the right. The movie that we're going to be reviewing does not get into the eight witnesses. So if you want to learn more about them, then head on over to Dan Vogel's YouTube series. Now, the Interpreter Foundation just updated this uh, particular movie, this 1963 movie, just this year. In fact, just this last couple of months i've watched it it's fantastic it has great production value high quality really amazing top quality work it is um it does have a few things that i think are not as accurate as they could be from my humble perspective but we don't have time to get into that particular movie today the three witnesses this movie right here let me give you a summary here um in 1881 david whitmer seeks the signature of general alexander w donovan on an affidavit attesting to his honesty and integrity with plans to have it published in the local paper in richmond missouri with a statement refuting that he had denied his witness that an angel had shown him the gold plates from whence the book of mormon was translated Whitmer recalls the translation of the book in 1829 while Joseph Smith and Oliver Cowdery stayed at the Whitmer family home in Fayette, New York. After praying together, an angel shows them the plates. All three are later excommunicated from the church, but as Whitmer relates, Oliver Cowdery and Martin Harris testified to the end of their lives to the truthfulness of what they witnessed, um, dying in 1950 and eight, I'm sorry, 1850 and 1875, respectively. And Donovan, who is a lawyer, he signs the document and says that he would hate to argue um, this uh arguing court against such strong evidence. Now, obviously there's gonna be some spoiler alerts with this. I am gonna, um, we're gonna watch most of the movie together. I am gonna talk over a couple of the scenes that are uh, the least important. We're gonna turn on the closed captioning here at this time. <laughs> Not all of these old church movies has closed captioning, so we're really grateful that this one does. Now, there's no need to have watched the movie uh, prior to this, but it um, makes for a better enjoyable experience if you have. Mostly, um, we are owe a uh, debt of gratitude to the Hard to Find Mormon videos, which is on YouTube. And this uh, channel was put together by Tom Doggett. So um, shout out to him. Now, the film is in the public domain. I looked it up at the National Archive, but the music is copyrighted. In fact, the, the reason the music is copyrighted is that the church bought access to what is called a VT-048 score. So this is um, a score that Hollywood musicians would lay down that could be used in a number of different movies, maybe even hundreds of movies. And you would just buy access to this particular volume of set, which has about, I don't know, about 70 tracks in it that you could use for various different parts of your movie. Once you purchased um, access to that, then you can use it for your film. That's why there's no composer for this movie. So I don't know if you think that you need to have uh, a triumphal fulfillment, then you just... <laughs> And you just queue up the triumphal fulfillment and you put it into your and you put it into your movie. Um, I now one last thing. This particular movie, The Three Witnesses, does not mention the eight witnesses. So I'm not going to mention the eight witnesses much either. Just following along with the movie track here. Now, this movie uh, is opening up on um, Richmond. This is Richmond, Missouri. And this is the town center of Richmond, Missouri. And we're set here in 1963, by the way. Now, the movie itself takes place most of it in 1881 when about 3,000 people live there. Now that number is uh, 6,000 people today and the town is about an hour east of Kansas City. And here uh, we get uh, introduced to the disembodied narrator. Now this uh, documentary has actually has two different narrators. Now this, remember that this movie takes place about 82 years after most of the events that took place in it actually happened. So it's set in 1961, uh, it's 19. It's shot in 1963, but it's set in 1881. But there are some flashbacks that take us all the way back to 1829. Now, this monument here is in the Richmond City Cemetery located on West Main Street, about a half a mile from the courthouse in the center of the town. The sign identifying uh, on the site notes that J David Whitmer is buried there. Also, Austin King, who is the judge who presided over Joseph Smith's um, inquiry in 1838, he's also buried there when Joseph Smith uh, was ordered to be executed in um, part of the uh, Mormon War. 
in, in accordance with uh, Lebron Boggs' uh, ex uh, uh, extermination order. Now, this monument here <clears throat> is also known as the uh, Oliver Cowdery Monument. That's the actual name of the monument. And this is the David Whitmer home here. We're going to see a recreation of that home in the um, in the film that we're going to see. But that's film. But this actual David Whitmer's actual home in Ray County uh, burned to the ground in 19 uh, in the 1920s. I want to say. Now here's a cemetery in Richmond, uh, and you can see some of the Whitmer uh, family here is buried there, including uh, Sally, who is the daughter of uh, of David Whitmer. Now look. Scrolling down a little bit further in this article, we see that the monument here was built by Junius Wells. He also built the monument to <clears throat> the Prophet Joseph Smith in uh, Sharon, Windsor County, Vermont. Once he was done uh, assembling and putting together the monument, it was trucked across the country on a train, and then it was put on the back of a wagon, and these horses and wagons took it the remainder of the way. So here it is on its journey, and then here it is in 1911 when it was dedicated in November 1st, 1911. Um, with the blessings of Joseph F. Smith. The Mormon Tabernacle Choir came across the plains, um, kind of reverse style from the pioneers from Salt Lake to Richmond County um, to uh, participate in the dedication. In fact, here is the playbill from the dedication of this particular monument, which is shown in the opening of the film. The first uh, number in this is an angel from on high. That's a very good uh, selection for this particular uh, dedication, I think. And here's the Mormon Tabernacle Choir in 1911 as they're sitting inside of the Ferris Opera House getting ready to dedicate this monument. So that's that's all the time that we can take on this monument. Now, film opens here. Uh, yeah, the film uh, opens here. This is a very lush score. It's very beautiful here. And they, they purchased that from the VT-048, of course, again. It took me a lot of trouble to try to find that score, by the way. Okay, so here we have our first look here at, at David Whitmer himself. Now, he's being portrayed here by Dwayne Ryan. Now, Dwayne Ryan, I can't find any other film credits about him. He's not an IMBD. If you Google him, he doesn't have a lot of acting credits or maybe none. He's basically a one-hit wonder. But I will show you what David Whitmer himself looks like, and you can compare the two. And I think that the uh, they did a good job of making him look like David Whitmer. Now, Grant Graff here is the mailman, and he's uh, playing George. The t um, yeah, he's playing the mailman, and he's delivering some mail here to uh, David Whitmer. I just deliver don't have time to read them. <laughs> I want to uh, congratulate you, Mr. Whitmer. Congratulate? For getting three letters in one day? No, for finally coming to your senses about that golden Bible story. What do you mean? Well, don't take me wrong now. We've always liked you. The whole town likes you. But it has made you look just a little peculiar to hang to that story about the angel. I'm glad we don't have to wonder about that now. Close call. What do you mean now? What is it you're driving at? Well, the whole town will know pretty soon how you came out and told John Murphy over in Polo that there weren't any golden plates with writings on them. Polo County. It was all a story. Mr. Story. Said I told him that. He did. I talked to him myself. But I never said that. Well, that's the story that's going around. And my advice is just to let it be. George, this story I can't let be. Suit yourself. One and two, you, David. David Whitmer ends up writing, um, this is this is all historical. John Murphy was a real person, Polo County. Um, he accused him of giving up his testimony. And that's where uh, David Whitmer had to take out a story in the paper, and then he also ended up writing a pamphlet, which was called A Proclamation Unto All Nations, Kindred's Tongues, and um, Unto All Nations, Kindred's Tongues, and People in 1881. He also ended up writing a couple of other uh, pamphlets slash books. Uh, one is an address to all believers in the Book of Mormon in 1887, and then another one is an address to all believers in Christ. So this film is centered around that first one, and you're going to hear David Whitmer quote from it here in a moment. Now, the mailman in this scene he really represents the typical anti-Mormon rube. He's unshaven. He's a little bit overweight. He's a yokel. He has just a you know a hick accent, and he's very much in contrast to David Whitmer. David Whitmer is industrious. He's well spoken. He's got a starch white shirt. He's he's industrious. He's he's in the gar he's in his garden gardening in a starched white shirt with suspenders and he looks sharp. So they're really contrasting the two here. Come on, Roger. Uh, um, I have to turn that down for the music. I don't want to get a copyright strike there now. 
David Whitmer is not happy about his uh, reputation being impugned. Now, we're opening up here on the town square here of Richmond, and this is a set that was uh, no doubt made by the uh, BYU Motion Picture Studio, probably in the Motion Picture Studio South, which is uh, near the town of Goshen or Alberta in South Utah County, is probably where this was uh, uh, shot at. Of course, all of these are just a facade, right? Now, here's uh, Dwayne Ryan. We already saw him. We're about to see Sherwood Keith, who plays General Donovan. And then we're going to see Ron Fredrickson, who plays Oliver Cowdery. And then Zan Wynn, who plays uh, Martin Harris. And then there's a few other bit part people as well as we saw Grant Graff playing the mailman and a couple of other bit parts. Now, here's David Whitmer. He is approaching to the town center on his uh, trusty steed. And he's going to be seeing his friend, General Don uh, Alexander Donovan. This is all according to the historic record. Everything thus far has been very true. Now, there's no mailman, but you get the idea. Now, we see the historical consultant on this, as I mentioned, is Richard L. Anderson. He knows a lot about the witnesses, probably the world's greatest expert on it. And uh, Scott Whitaker, the Whitt Whitaker probably wrote, uh, it says story consultant, but he wrote the story to it. And then we also have, um, he, we also have uh, Wetzel, uh, Wetzel Whitaker, um, who is the show producer. Now, this is our first look here at uh, uh, Sherwood Keith. Now, Sherwood Keith is the actor here who plays General Donovan. And Sherwood Keith was a professional uh, actor. He was born in Somerville in Massachusetts. He was known for playing the man uh, from Uncle in The Three Witnesses, The Silent Call, Patty. You can see he had a career um, that spanned, you know, mostly in the 50s and 60s. And then he passed away in California in 1972. And he is playing the role of Alexander William Donovan. And General Donovan here is uh, was born in uh, 1808, died in 1887, uh, one year prior to when David Whitmer passed away. He was an attorney, a soldier, politician from Missouri, who's best known today as the man who prevented the summary execution of Joseph Smith at the close of the 1830 Mormon War, and also a successful defense attorney in the Missouri towns of Liberty, Richmond, and Independence. Wetzelow Whitaker came over uh, as the producer and the director in the kingpin for this particular film. He came over, uh, was recruited from Disney, and he helped start the motion picture studio in 1953. Oh, what's the matter? Someone stole one of your horses? Worse. Somebody's trying to steal my good name. Your good name? <laughs> That'll be pretty hard to do. Now, the inside of the set is almost assuredly in the motion picture studio, which is in Provo off of uh, 900 East or 2200 North, depending on how you want to divide it up. We, the undersigned citizens of Richmond, Ray County, Missouri, where David Whitmer Sr. has resided since the year A.D. 1838, certify that we have been long and intimately acquainted with him and know him to be a man of the highest integrity and of undoubted truth and veracity. Will you sign it? I don't understand it, David. Who would question your integrity? And you, a former mayor of this town. Never mind. All right, David Whitmer was the mayor of the town for a brief period of time, and he really did look for an affidavit for people to up, uh, uphold and say that he was an honest man. Most of the rest of the time, David Whitmer lived in Richmond, Missouri for almost 50 years. Most of the rest of the time, he ran a livery stable, which is where he had equine horses, horse breeding, horse uh, boarding, that type of thing. This affidavit will appear in the Richmond Conservator next week. Yes, it did. Along with this statement uh, by me. And this is the proclamation, as I referenced earlier. And, and now he's going to read directly from the proclamation. Tongues and people. It having been represented by one John Murphy of Polo, Caldwell County, Missouri, that I, in a conversation with him last summer, denied my testimony as one of the three witnesses of the Book of Mormon. To the end, therefore, that he may understand me now, if he did not then, and that the world may know the truth, I wish now, standing as it were in the very sunset of life and in the fear of God, once and for all, to make this public statement that I never have at any time denied that testimony or any part thereof which has so long since been published with that book as one of the three witnesses i do again affirm the truth of all my statements as then made and published 
he that hath an ear to hear, let him hear. It was no delusion. What is written is written, and he that readeth, let him understand. I don't understand you Mormons. Okay, so he read directly from the proclamation. That's a direct quote. So the filmmakers did a very good job there. Now, Alexander Do uh, General Donovan is saying, I don't understand you Mormons. At this point in time, David Whitmer, he hadn't been a Mormon for 43 years. So he doesn't consider himself to be a Mormon at this point in time. It was the same way with Joseph. I couldn't get near him without starting to believe the things he said. That's not hard to explain, Alexander. The things he said were true. Well, I defended him in the courtroom time and time again. True. He never gave me reason not to believe him. Once, as a general, I refused to obey an illegal order to execute him. 1838, Far West, Missouri. Joseph of, Smith. The end of the Mormon War. An amazing man. True. He was more than that. Joseph Smith was a prophet of God. And the book he translated is the word of God, just as surely as the Bible is. Now that all this time has passed, David, now that Joseph Smith's been dead for nearly 40 years, do you really feel as strongly as you once did about Joseph and the Book of Mormon? Okay, so he's asking David Whitmer if he feels strongly about Joseph Smith and the Book of Mormon. Let's see the response. I most assuredly do. Uh, okay, so, I mean, he felt very strongly about the Book of Mormon if you read his pamphlets. He felt uh, quite the opposite about Joseph Smith. Okay, so that's, um, that's not very accurate. I've never heard the whole story about you and the other two men seeing the golden plates. And rumor seldom comes close to the truth. Do you have time, David, to tell me about it? Well, if you have time to listen. It's a strange story, but I testify that it's the truth. Okay, now we're going to flash back to, I have to turn it down for the music. Here's Joseph Smith here. Here is the young 24-year-old David Whitmer, and here is Oliver Cowdery. So theoretically, this scene probably took place sometime in maybe April or May of uh, 1829. Uh, the problem with that, that I have with this scene is that David Whitmer did go to fetch Joseph Smith from Harmony, Pennsylvania, because translating the Book of Mormon in the Hale household was difficult. So that is uh, historically uh, that is historically accurate. And by the way, let me pull up a map here. When it comes to, uh, so you can give you an idea about what we're talking about. So Joseph Smith, he started in Palmyra, then he moved to Harmony, Pennsylvania in, I believe, December of 1827. Now we're in May of 1829, and this is after uh, Emma had her miscarriage there. She, they're being recalled back up to Fayette from David Whitmer, who was actually driving the wagon himself. Come to know the Smith while boarding with them as a school teacher. And when he met Joseph, Oliver became devoted to him. The big problem, like I said, with the scene is it's supposed to be representing David Whitmer bringing Joseph Smith from Harmony to Fayette, which is where the, mo the majority of the Book of Mormon that we have today was dictated in Fayette, New York. The problem is, is where is Emma? OK, if that's if that's what this is supposed to be taking place, Emma is supposed to be there. If this is not what that's supposed to be taking place, then it's just a strange scene. So it's just a little weird here. So did I. Joseph was a man that, well, a man that was unusual. Um, let's take a look here. We saw Fred, uh, Ron Fredrickson. Ron Fredrickson was um, playing the part of Oliver Cowdery. Now, Ron Fredrickson was a famous um, Mormon actor. He played in a couple of different church films. And, but he really, um, he spent a lot of time on the uh, stage, uh, you know, in Shakespeare and other uh, works on stage is where he spent a lot of time. You can see him down here, the Pinnacle Acting Company and the Sunshine Boys. But his most famous role, is that he played Lucifer in the endowment, Mormon endowment movie. Now this, uh, for those listeners out there, this is the 1969 version of the endowment, which is before they reshot it under Gordon B. Hinckley in the more famous uh, ones after they took out the penalties. But this, he played Lucifer with the penalties in the temple in the film strip version, not even a VHS tape. 
Now, that is truly one of the most hard to find Mormon videos that there ever is. Now, uh, Oliver Cowdery in real life, uh, this is what he looked like. This is probably his most famous uh, daguerreotype here, which was taken, um, I think, within uh, one or two years of when he ended up passing away. Do that right off. I hope now we can publish the book soon. It contains the fullness of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Yeah, hoping that he can publish the book soon. But remember, he lost the manuscript here, and now he's being fetched to go to uh, Fayette, New York. The vast majority of the Book of Mormon has not even been written. It was only with Oliver Cowdery that he was able to really get the things uh, get get things rolling. So it seems pretty premature to talk about publishing something when you it's really not even off of the ground here. And by the way, Oliver Cowdery, he was a um, he was related to Joseph Smith. I believe he was a cousin. I want to say he was his second cousin. Something the world is almost lost. However long the book takes, you're welcome to stay at our home until it's done. OK, well, uh, that's nice of you, David Whitmer. However, it is not David Whitmer's home. It's John Whitmer's home, the first of uh, who became eventually became the first church historian. So, I mean, you're welcome to stay at our home, I suppose so. But it is not David Whitmer's home that he's staying in. Thank you, David. I knew you would come when Oliver sent for you. With all the persecution here in Pennsylvania, it's been impossible for Joseph to complete the translation of the plates. There really wasn't that much persecution in Pennsylvania because it's 150 miles away from Palmyra. And people are not willing to make a four-day journey to come down to Harmony to uh, persecute Joseph Smith, although some people did, including Lucy Harris. And you found these plates buried in a hillside? I didn't really find them. I was directed there by the angel Moroni, who... Okay, so he said he was directed there by an angel Moroni, but just remember that the term Moroni and the term Nephi at this point in church history had been very much conflated. We have a lot of records from all the way up until 1841 in the Times and Seasons where it was Nephi giving Joseph Smith the plates. That also appears, and that's an official church um, production. It also appears in the Millennial Star, which was the official church uh, magazine, I believe in Jackson County from 1831 to 1833, as memory serves. That also appears to be uh, Nephi. And also in the remembrances of Lucy Mac Smith, it's Nephi, not Moroni. So I'm sure that the filmmakers have, you know, the modern church has settled that it was Moroni and they've gotten rid of all those Nephi references. But a lot of the church uh, first uh, publications have it being Nephi. Was a prophet on this continent over a thousand years ago. His father, Mormon, compiled and condensed the record. Can I see the plates? The Lord has made known to me that he will call special witnesses to these men. So, yes, the Lord did make that clear in Doctrine and Covenants, Section 5, in March of 1829, that there would be additional witnesses to the Book of Mormon. It's also, uh, the witnesses are also mentioned in the Book of Ether, but probably the Book of Ether, they hadn't gotten to the Book of Ether yet, so they wouldn't have known about that. Because remember, the order of the translation of the Book of Mormon is Mosiah through Moroni, and then he picked back up for the lost pages starting in First Nephi up until the words of Mormon. Men, he will show the plates, and they must testify along with me. But at present... I've been commanded to show them to no one. He's been commanded to show them uncovered to no one. Okay, many people have seen the plates through a frock, through a cloth, or uh, through some, some other means. But he has not showed them uncovered to anyone. Okay, so it appears that the horses have gotten their drink. That was the whole purpose of the scene was the horses taking a break. And by the way, it makes it seem like this is Joseph Smith horse uh, and, and wagon. It's not. It's the Whitmer's wagons and on uh, horses. Now, we are coming up on uh, one of the most problematic scenes. This, by the way, would have been like a three-day journey from Fayette to uh, Harmony. So round trip, it would have been like a week of David Whitmer being on the road. Okay, so now we're opening up on a very problematic scene here. And uh, as you can see right off the bat, the face in the hat, Joseph Smith's face, face in the hat is missing. Now, we're going to hear David Whitmer narrating through this scene. But the words that he says for the narration... Those aren't his words this time. So we had many, many direct quotes previously in the film from the three witnesses. Now we're going to depart from that and do an odd summary. At my father's home in Fayette, New York, the work progressed rapidly. Joseph dictated his translation of the plates to Oliver, who served as scribe. Okay, so... That's what David Whitmer is narrating. But that's not what David Whitmer said in real life. We have it from his own words here, from an address to all believers in Christ in Richmond of 1887. It says, quote, Joseph Smith would put a seer stone into a hat and put his face in the hat, drawing it closely around his face to exclude the light. And in the darkness, the spiritual light would shine. A piece of something resembling parchment would appear. And on that appeared the writing. 
one character at a time would appear and under it was the interpretation in English. Brother Joseph would read off the English to Oliver Cowdery, who was his principal scribe. And when it was written down and repeated to Brother Joseph to see if it was correct, then it would disappear and another character with the interpretation would appear. Thus, the Book of Mormon was translated by the gift and power of God and not by any of man. End quote. So that's a far cry from what we just heard, right? Okay. So uh, it's a very troubling uh, rendition, to say the least. And of course, where is the seer stone? Smith described uh, Joseph Smith using several different seer stones during the translation process, not just the chocolate covered one that we all know, but this is the most famous uh, of his seer stones, which I think that the church uh, brought out into the public eye, I want to say in about 2012, I think it was. Uh, but this is what he would have used. And when ye shall receive these things, I would exhort you that ye would ask God, the Eternal Father, in the name of Christ, if these things are not true, and if ye shall ask with a sincere heart, with real intent, Joseph. Okay, so this is the end of the translation scene. Well, I really don't know how people continue to argue that the plates never existed. There's overwhelming evidence to the contrary. However, the movie shows that the plates are out in the open. Witnesses say that the plates, not only are they not out in the open, they're not even in the same room. In fact, they're not even in the same house. I'm not going to go through the quotes to demonstrate that, but there's a lot of overwhelming evidence for that. Now, the number of plates here that is being represented, I think, is too many plates. It looks like, from my estimation, that there's maybe 100, 125 plates. That's far too many, according to the contemporary accounts. The total size of the plates, though, seems good. The plates were about eight inches by six inches by six inches, so that's pretty good. And David Whitmer himself described the plates as having a whitish yellow color. And the thickness is also pretty good. They were as thick as common tin. However, there's a problem with the stream of dictation. Um, according to Royal Skousen of the uh, of Brigham Young University and the Critical Text Project, who's the second, uh, I think the second director of the Critical Text Project, the evidence suggests that Joseph dictated 20 to 30 words at a time, and he did far more than that in that particular uh, stream of consciousness. And in fact, that is Moroni. He was uh, dictating Moroni chapter 10 verses three through five. But like I said, that's not the end of the Book of Mormon. And again, finally, there's a narrator in this documentary, but for some reason, uh, David Whitmer is narrating the scene, and they chose not to use David Whitmer's real words when we have access to those words. Okay, so it's, uh, it's not good. Now, the new Witnesses movie that I mentioned earlier, the one that's from the Interpreter Foundation, it does definitely does a better job with the scene of showing Joseph Smith in the hat. But uh, it's still uh, showing the covered plates on the table, and I don't necessarily think that is very accurate. Oh, by the way, if we go back to this particular scene, just backing it up just a teeny bit, we can see Joseph and a hat. Okay, so they are showing a hat. The only problem is, is that the hat that is shown here, Joseph Smith dictated it using a white hat and not a dark colored hat here. So you'd like to give the uh, filmmakers props. However, we can't do so in this particular instance. These things. Now, there's no dates, uh, virtually no dates that are in this entire documentary. So you kind of have to piece it together and figure out when things happened. Still, Joseph had not shown the plates to us, and he then delivered them back to the angel Moroni. So Joseph Smith gave the plates back to the angel Moroni in the summer, sometime in the summer of 1829. Soon after that came the day that none who were there will ever forget. Okay, so we're opening on the scene here that happens a couple of days after the uh, translation is complete, even though... Like I said, in the last scene, I mean, he's dictating Moroni and you're thinking that it's complete. Well, that's just not the way that it works. It was, if he had been doing the words of Mormon, then we would know that he was done. So the filmmakers seem to be ignorant of the proper uh, trans of the order of translation of the Book of Mormon. There's uh, this scene right here that we're seeing. Um, it really did happen. And it probably happened sometime in the last week of June of 1829. And we get the account of this meeting from Lucy Mac Smith in her remembrances. And Lucy and Joseph Smith Sr., they did travel from Palmyra, New York, to Fayette, New York, for this particular, uh, we'll call it a devotional. And that's a distance of about 31 miles, you know, take a half a day, really, for you to get there. And I want to speculate as to who the people are in this particular scene. Joseph had sent for his parents. Now, he sent for his parents. This has got to be Lucy Mac Smith. And that's got to make this Joseph Smith Sr., because they're sitting next to each other. And I want to speculate that this is supposed to be represented by John Whitmer here, because he's the head of the household. Whom he had not seen since he had begun the translation. They arrived with Martin Harris, 
Okay, so here's Martin Harris here. He's uh, being portrayed here by Zan Nguyen, who plays Martin Harris. Nothing else about Martin Harris can I find. Let's compare the actor with what uh, Martin Harris really looks like here. And uh, you can see that he's got that Amish or kind of like the uh, Mennonite beard there going for him. Um, so I think, I think it's pretty accurate. A friend of the Smiths who had been interested in the work from the first. That's an understatement. After our morning devotion, and I believe that the woman on the left there would have been uh, Oliver Cowdery's uh, love interest, uh, Catherine uh, Whitmer Cowdery. No. And this is consistent with the Lord's plan for, as Paul said in 2 Corinthians, in the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. Now, right at around this time is when Martin Harris is uh, ha decides to mortgage most of his farm to pay for the printing of the Book of Mormon on June 25th, 1829. Now, that is a tremendous sum. Would have been a sum that is worth about a million dollars in today's money. It was $3,000 at the time, but that was a tremendous amount of money. Now, the film uses direct and accurate quotes from Lucy Mac Smith's remembrances in this meeting. So prior to this, we have very accurate quotes, quoting directly from the proclamation, quoting directly from David Whitmer's remembrances. Then we have the translation scene, and then immediately thereafter, we go back to accuracy. So the film, you can't just blame this on filmmakers and say, oh, the filmmakers, they, they're, you know, they're not professional historians. They don't know what they're doing. No, they do, because we had history before. Then we decided to do a faith-promoting narrative, and now we're doing history right afterwards. It was a conscious decision to, have, um, to, to portray a translation scene that was not in accordance with the historic record. Martin Harris, you have got to humble yourself before God this day that you may obtain a forgiveness of your sins. Lucifer. If you do, it is the will of God that you should look upon the plates in company with Oliver Cowdery and David Whitmer. Okay, they're pumped about that. Oliver Cowdery's pumped and Martin Harris. Oh, yeah, let's see this stuff, baby. We're ready to rock and roll. I have to turn this down for the musical. Uh, I have to turn this down for music copy right now. This is the woods. Uh, this is probably somewhere in the Fayette Township, New York. The closest that I can date this for you folks is uh, 11 o'clock a.m. on Sunday, June 28, 1829. Was prob that's probably the best date that there was. We then prepared ourselves to call upon Almighty God. Let's speed this up just a little bit. The station he had promised. Joseph prayed first. Then each of us in turn, but we received no answer. It's very accurate. We again observed the same order of prayer, but with the same results as before. And we pray that despite our weaknesses, thou wilt be merciful unto us and grant us a knowledge of that wonderful thing that thou hast done in bringing forth the Book of Mormon. We know that I'm sorry. Okay. So Martin Harris is not, is, uh, not feeling it, so he ends up withdrawing himself. And then they repray again, and this is when they are able to receive the divine manifestation. Now, uh, decades later, David Whitmer described this particular experience. It's also in the uh, opening of the Book of Mormon, but he explained it in more detail later. He said, quote, we not only saw the plates of the Book of Mormon, but also the brass plates, the plates of the Book of Ether, the plates containing the record of the wickedness of the people of the world, and many other plates, end quote. He also described a table holding the sword of Laban, the Eliahona, the interpreters, all of which were objects mentioned in the Book of Mormon translation and which previous revelations had promised the witnesses that they would see. Now, I, I don't I don't really know what the plates of the wickedness of the people is, and he doesn't mention uh, stones or interpreters. And you think about which angel it is that gave them the plates or let them have this experience. Um, maybe you think of this Moroni, but the problem is, is that Moroni, he's not a resurrected being at this time, right? So he can't hand anything to anybody. He doesn't have a body. So maybe it was one of the three Nephites. I'm just speculating here because the three Nephites never tasted of death and they would still have corporeal bodies. Which you have seen is correct. And I command you to bear record of what you now see and hear. We did bear record of that vision. Our names are signed to a statement of it that appears in every copy of the Book of Mormon. Oliver Cowdery, David Whitmer, Martin. So he says his name is signed in every copy of the Book of Mormon, and he puts his finger on it. Do you see a signature? 
in every copy of the Book of Mormon? I sure don't. What I see is three printed names. So by 1885, in an interview with uh, James Moyle, uh, David Whitmer talks about the signature pages. He said, quote, the witnesses did not sign the original manuscript, though they were present and ordered Oliver Cowdery to sign for them, end quote. So there seems to be some confusion about this point. It may be that the original manuscript of the Book of Mormon was signed, but at any rate, the modern copies of the Book of Mormon and the original uh, 1830 version, they only included a printed statement, no signatures. And remember, the entire printer's manuscript was copied from the original manuscript by Oliver Cowdery, including the witness statements. Uh, so, you know, maybe he copied over the signatures. I don't, there's just a lot of debate about that point. I couldn't figure out the answer to it. So if you know the answer, then drop me um, drop me a comment in the uh, comment of this movie. I'd like to know the answer to that. Uh, we only have like 28% of the original manuscript. Uh, and I don't know if we have the witnesses page. Not sure about that. Martin Harris. Martin Harris? Yes, Martin did humble himself and saw the plates and the angel later in the day, just as we had. But, David, if you really saw the things you've told me, why did you leave Joseph in the church he organized? You did leave, didn't you? Okay, so we have plenty. Yes, of course, he did leave the church. Uh, and we have plenty of David Whitmer's own words about why he left the church. David's relationship with Joseph and the church uh, continued to deteriorate throughout the remainder of 1837 after the Kirtland banking scandal. And finally, in January of 1838, uh, David Whitmer, W.W. W. Phelps, and John Whitmer were removed as the presidency of the church in Missouri. And finally, in April 1836, David was asked to appear before the Missouri High Council in Far West to answer the charges given against him. And David was accused of several things, particularly not observing the word of wisdom, unchristian-like conduct, neglecting to attend his meetings and uniting with and having the same spirit as apostates plus a bunch of additional charges. David, he refused to answer these charges. He said he would refuse to acknowledge the legality of these former councils. And he said, uh, to spare you any trouble, I'm going to withdraw my fellowship from you and I'm going to uh, make, make my place in the world with those who are meek and humble, who will uh, respect the revelations of heaven and uh, the rights of mankind. After reading the letter that the uh, high counselors said, hey, we're not going to investigate this anymore, since he's already contemptuous, contemptuously withdrawn himself from fellowship, we're going to excommunicate him and Oliver Cowdery. So, like I said, we have lots of words of what David Whitmer felt about the church. You know, he didn't like the changes to the Book of Commandments, and he didn't like the direction that the church was going in. And, of course, the filmmakers now, they're going to depart significantly from David Whitmer's own words and plant new words into his mouth about why he ended up leaving the church. Yes, I did. And so did Oliver and Martin for a time. But why, if, if what you said is true? About eight years after we saw the plates, there came a time of trial and great difficulty for the church, both from within and without. Persecution, money problems, jealousies, hurt, bitterness, pride, all took their toll. But that doesn't change the truth of our experience with the angel. None of us, Oliver, Martin, myself, ever denied our testimony of the Book of Mormon. David, as a lawyer, I'm amazed. Oh? How's that? You could find no better evidence than this. Each of you became personally disaffected from Joseph Smith. True, we did. And none of you ever tried to expose him as a fraud? None of you ever said, he deceived me. I was mistaken. There was no angel. I mean, this is the big question. Do you still believe in the Book of Mormon? Do you still believe in Joseph Smith? So let's hear his response. There was no deception. There was no deception. Joseph was an honest man. What? I, I, it's just, just these words that they're putting into David Whitmer's house, uh, mouth make no sense. David Whitmer had a big falling out with Joseph Smith, and um, he didn't feel like Joseph Smith was a prophet anymore. Now, he earlier said Joseph Smith was a prophet. That's accurate. But, I mean, just <laughs> David Whitmer maintained his testimony of the Book of Mormon. David Whitmer did not think that Joseph Smith, uh, towards the end of his ministry, was uh, doing God's will. It's uh, The filmmakers are trying to have it both ways. In a court of law, one witness is enough to substantiate a claim. And you had three.
I don't believe I ever knew Martin Harris. What became of him? Martin remained in Kirtland, Ohio for a long time. True. Later, he went to Utah. Much later. He was rebaptized into the church. Just a few years ago, when Martin was 92, he was taken seriously ill. I mean, David Whitmer here uh, in the movie, he's skipping over a huge swath of Martin Harris's life. Yes, Martin Harris did remain in Kirtland for a long period of time, which is true. He essentially became the janitor there for the... Uh, for the temple there in England. But they're skipping over the fact that Martin Harris spent a long time outside of the church. He was uh, bouncing from religion to religion, joined a couple of different sects, including following James Strang, uh, the so-called king of Beaver Island. And he, uh, the Strangites, ended up serving a mission for the Strangites in England, he bounced around all over the place. In fact, Martin Harris, even before he became a Mormon, he changed religions as well. I mean, changed the religions a lot. He was a very spiritually fickle person. So um, now we're opening on a scene here, which I have to turn down for the musical reasons here. This is Bishop Smith, who's greeting Martin Harris Jr. And we have now transported ourselves back to Clarkston, Utah. Now, Martin Harris immigrated to Utah when he was 88 years old. He, say, he was rebaptized in the endowment house in 1870. Uh, I'm sorry, no, the, the, he, he spent 35 years outside of the church. Um, so this is uh, Bishop Smith. This is Martin Harris Jr. Now, this a scene probably was set in the BYU Motion Picture Studio. Um, and who is the woman that we're seeing here? Well, remember, first of all, Martin Harris's first wife, Lucy Harris. Uh, the, remember the first real Mormon villain of the 116 Lost Pages? She died in 1836. So immediately after her death, Martin remarried Caroline Young, who immigrated west and remarried in Utah. While Martin explored a, a several different uh, several different religions, and the film seems to show Martin and Caroline as cohabitating couple, but they were probably just friends. So, yes, his second wife left to Utah without him, remar uh, then got married, and then her husband died, and now they're getting back together. Um, it's it's just kind of weird, uh, but they were probably not uh, a cohabitating couple. Now, this is Martin Harris on his supposed to be on his deathbed here. He's been unconscious for a number of days at this point. And according to William Homer, uh, let me read this quote here. When, quote, when we first entered the room, the old gentleman appeared to be sleeping. He soon woke up and asked for a drink of water. I put my arm under the old gentleman, raising him up, and my mother held the glass to his lips. He drank freely. Then he looked at me and recognized me. He said, I know you. You are my friend. I did see the plates on which the Book of Mormon was written. I did see the angel. I did hear the voice of God. I know that Joseph Smith is a prophet of God, holding the keys of the priesthood. Who showed us the plates of gold? The Book of Mormon is true. I know what I know. I know what I know. So they have a pageant there uh, that they, uh, the people of Clarkston commemorate their most famous resident there in Clarkston, Utah. And here's Clarkston way at the top of Utah. And by the way, I was just there a couple of days ago visiting Martin Harris's grave. Um, here's the monument um, to Martin Harris's grave in Clarkston, Utah. And they do a pageant there, or they used to at least. Uh, the church has uh, kind of gotten, gotten away for some of these pageants, but it used to be the man who knew. Remember, and we heard him say, I know what I know. I've seen what I've seen and heard what I've heard. And that was Martin's last testimony. Hmm. A man's last words can usually be taken as truth. And all of us. I knew him for a short while. He began practicing law, didn't he? Yes, he came here to see me in 1850. Uh, General Donovan could have known Oliver Cowdery because Oliver Cowdery came to Richmond, Missouri um, after he rejoined the church in an effort to recruit David Whitmer back into the church and so that they would both go back. Um, Oliver Cowdery wanted to immigrate west and rejoin the Brighamite sect. And he told me what had since happened to him. Uh, this will interest you, Alexander, being a lawyer. Oliver had okay, now here is the next scene. This is a really an apocryphal scene here. Uh, I don't believe that this scene actually happened in history, but it's Oliver Cowdery trying to argue a case, and they're bringing up his Mormon background against him, saying, hey, um, we can't trust you as a lawyer because you're a Mormon. And it just shows that conflict. But it's very apocryphal. Probably didn't happen. Now, Oliver Cowdery, he left the church mostly over financial issues. I simply cannot find this scene in my historic searches. I'm not a historian, but I can't find it. 
This is basically a representative scene of the persecution that Oliver faced when trying to go back to living a normal life after being so heavily involved in the early founding of the church. Remember, Oliver Cowdery, he, there's some evidence that he even joined the Methodist church. He was really trying to leave it all behind him. Now, after leaving Missouri in the fall of 1838, after he was excommunicated, Oliver Cowdery returned to Kirtland, uh, settling close to his non-Mormon brother. And then in 1840, Oliver was admitted to the Ohio Bar as an attorney where he practiced law in Kirtland. Cowdery moved in the fall of 1840 to Tiffin, a town in northwestern Ohio, where he continued as a lawyer for the next several years. I pulled up some of uh, Martin Harris's uh, legal uh, cases that he was involved with when he went to Tiffin here. Uh, plea for trespassing, an amicable suit. Uh, an assault, a judgment uh, of property, uh, uh, somebody stole a yoke of cattle, and uh, just a, a lot of different legal cases that he was involved with. Oliver Cowdery was a brilliant man. He was originally a schoolmaster, and that's how he got to know Joseph Smith was by boarding with the Smiths in Palmyra, and then he eventually taught himself the law. I mean, he's just a lot of cases there. A uh, particular scene here where he's allegedly kind of being put on trial, that, that makes for good cinema. I'm being put on trial for being a Mormon just really did not happen. Objection overruled. Okay, objection overruled. Let's hear the evidence against Oliver Cowdery being a Mormon. Now, the church leaders, they repeatedly exchanged letters with Oliver Cowdery and tried to, to try to persuade him to uh, rejoin the saints. And in it, swearing that the book is true, is the signature of the man sitting before this court. No, there's no signature in there, buddy. Cowdery. There's no signature. This is the man who has testified and written that he beheld an angel of God. <gasps> and that the angel showed him the plates from which the Book of Mormon was translated. He should have said gold plates. That sounds a lot better if he would have said gold plates or gold Bible, even better. Quiet! Okay, sorry. Shh. Sorry. Well, now, it's quite possible there could be more than one Oliver Cowdery, you know then surely he'll want to clear this up. Cowdery? Am I going to take the stand? I'm not a Mormon anymore. Should I defend the Book of Mormon? I'm not a Mormon. He seems reluctant. May I? It's, it's kind of odd to me that Lucifer's holding the Book of Mormon, but... That's okay. I mean, we'll just put that past your memory. We declare with words of soberness that an angel of God came down from heaven and laid before our eyes the plates and the engravings thereon. The voice of the Lord commanded that we should bear record of it. Wherefore, we bear testimony of these things. I am that Oliver Cowdery. Whatever my faults and weaknesses might be, this testimony which I have written and given to the world is literally true. What I have there said that I saw, I know that I saw. Okay, so it's, well, by the way, we don't we don't get to find out what the verdict was. It just said, you know, you can't be, you're not honest, you can't be a Mormon. And then they just leave us hanging. We don't even find out what happened in the so-called trial there. I mean, it's, it's just a filmic device. It didn't really happen. So this next scene is probably the most accurate scene in the movie. Now, Oliver made a hurried trip from southern Wisconsin to the Saints camp in Iowa during a special local conference. And this was uh, taking place in the vicinity of Council Bluffs. Here's Council Bluffs. This is the uh, so-called Mormon trail right here that we're following along the North Platte River. And I guess it doesn't show the Santa Fe Trail. The Santa Fe Trail goes down here like this. This is what the Mormon Battalion took. But So now we're in Council Bluffs here, and uh, Oliver Cowdery came down from Wisconsin here to, to rejoin the Saints. To ten years of being a part yeah, he was, out, he was out of the church for about 10 years. Uh, now, uh, this, is, uh, this is close to Mosquito Creek. And uh, while uh, Elder Orson Hyde, he was the presiding official and he was preaching at the time and speaking, Elder Hyde immediately recognized the presence of the former associate president. And there's uh, Orson Hyde right there. He stopped speaking, came down off the stand and embraced Cowdery, taking him by the arm. Orson brought Oliver up to the platform. And after a brief introduction, Oliver was inspired, invited to speak to the conference. So again, this is another very accurate scene that like word for word follows exactly what happened in history. So these filmmakers know their history. Sister Cowdery. Sister Cowdery, uh, Carolyn Whit uh, Whitmer Cowdery. 
come up on the stand with me, Oliver. Very accurate. That's Oliver Cowdery. <gasps> Rockstar. Now, with uh, overwhelming uh, emotion swelling in his heart, this is according to the contemporary account, okay? Uh, in a clear and striking voice, Oliver Cowdery addressed this gathering of nearly 2,000 people. They didn't have enough extras for this scene. The largest Mormon audience that he had ever spoken to or ever would speak to. He bore a spontaneous and lucid testimony of his personal involvement in the early years of the church. Cowdery detailed the coming forth of the Book of Mormon, the restoration of the Aaronic and Melchizedek priesthood, and he reaffirmed his staunch belief in the Prophet Joseph Smith's divine appointment and mission. Oliver recalled that years earlier he had laid hands on Elder Hyde's head and ordained him to the priesthood and extended him a call to be an apostle. So Cowdery unequivocally acknowledged the Twelve's authority to lead the church. And I think it's very interesting that he speaks so much of priesthood because the three witnesses were the ones who helped select the Quorum of the Twelve in 1835. I desire to come back. I seek no station. I wish only to be identified with you. Maybe the best scene in the movie right here. I wish to come in at the door. I know the door. Yeah. I was the first man to be baptized by authority in this dispensation. Right, in 1829. And now I ask to be baptized again. I wrote with my own pen the entire Book of Mormon, save a few pages. As it fell from the lips of the prophet Joseph, as he translated it by the gift and power of God. That's a direct quote. I beheld with my eyes and handled with my hands the gold plates from which it was transcribed. That's from the introduction to the Book I of Mormon. I saw the glorious messenger who showed us these plates. And I heard the voice of the Lord declare that the work was true. I was present with Joseph when the holy priesthood was restored to this earth. That priesthood was conferred upon me, and I held it as a servant of God. Now we don't get to hear um, uh, Oliver Cowdery's last words. They don't. They don't. They don't kill him off in this movie. But he died uh, not long after this, unfortunately, in 1850. Now, his last words on his deathbed were, uh, "Quote: I want you to remember what I say to you. I am a dying man, and what would it profit me to tell you a lie? I know that this that the Book of Mormon was translated by the gift and power of God. My eyes saw." My ears heard, my understanding was touched, and I know whereof I testified is true. It was no dream, no van, vain imagination of the mind. It was real. So the world has caused me to suffer because of it. He was persecuted very much for his I beliefs. I know that Joseph Smith was a prophet of God. To the end of his life, he was true to that calling. Almost crying, got it. Very powerful. Almost on the edge of tears. planned to go west with the church, but while he was here in Richmond visiting with me, he was taken ill and died. Tuberculosis. His final words to me were a plea that, that I would be true to my testimony of the Book of Mormon. Oliver died a happy man. Oh, well, I mean... He died. Tuberculosis is a horrible way to die. It's like suffocating. Your lungs fill. Your lungs fill with fluid. It's. It takes a really long time. You can't breathe. Um, I don't know how happy you can be when you're dying of tuberculosis. The happiest I ever saw. That seems unlikely, but I guess I wasn't there. I'm the only one of the three left in this life. Yeah, he's the only one of the three who is left. That's why he had so many interviews. He's the most interviewed of all of the witnesses. Life. To their last breaths, the others were true to the calling we received from the Lord, and so will I be. No force on earth can make me deny what I know. Thank you again. David, I'd hate to be the lawyer assigned to challenge what you have told me. Okay. Now, on the way out here, this is the closing scene. On the way out here, there's a small show blooper that I uh, think that I picked up uh, when I was watching this. If you look, there's some green foliage here on the right-hand side. Um, you can see some leaves and some stuff. But when David Whitmer walks out the front door, 
There's no foliage over here on the left-hand side. Three witnesses died in January of 1888. One of the Richmond newspapers reviewed his connection with the coming forth of the Book of Mormon and concluded, Skeptics may laugh and scoff if they will, but no man could listen to Mr. Whitmer as he talked of his interview with the angel of the Lord without being most forcibly convinced that he has heard an honest man tell what he honestly believes to be true. Okay, so David Whitmer, he's the only one of the three witnesses who did, who did not join, rejoin the Brighamite sect. Now, this movie, which is actually basically a short, it doesn't present itself as a drama with a plot. It's just a dramatization of history. Now, critically speaking, the film whitewashes the differences that the three witnesses had with Joseph Smith and Brigham Young. And the translation scene is highly inaccurate. Everything else, I think, is really good. Uh, we also need to discuss uh, uh, if the three witnesses saw the plates in reality or saw them with their spiritual eye, second sight, eye of faith, trance, supernaturally, whatever. Um, there's many, many quotes that can be used to make us think either way on this. But more quotes from my perspective seem to show that the witnesses believe that their experiences to be actual in reality rather than in a vision or a spiritual eye. Although the exception, I would say, would be Martin Harris. He seems to indicate a supernatural of uh, he seems to have a very supernatural way of looking at spiritual experiences. He has a very magical worldview. And that's the issue that I have is that all of these early saints had a mystical and magical worldview. So I don't just don't know how. Um, important it is to separate their supernatural experiences from the quote-unquote actual. They didn't make those kind of designations or separations. I don't think that we should too. We should either. Now, the three witnesses' faithfulness is perhaps the least important of all of the truth claims, in my humble opinion. When it comes down to it, it actually makes extremely little difference to the truthfulness claims of the Book of Mormon if every single witness, both the three and the eight, either affirmed or denied or, or whatever. There's a significant section in the CS letter, for instance, that, that talks about the witnesses and whether they saw what they said they saw or remain true to their testimonies or saw things in a vision or denied things, whatever. I find that section to be very uh, uh, uncompelling and, and basically irrelevant. And that's the difference between the Book of Mormon and so many other spiritual revelations like the Quran or the Shaker revelations of Joseph Smith's day. If Muhammad or like David Koresh, if they said that they made it all up, um, that's devastating to their truthfulness claims. I think that just that's a sledgehammer. But I don't think so for the Book of Mormon because the Book of Mormon is... Um, you know, the Book of Mormon is different. It's tangible and it's subject to a wide variety of different scrutinies. Now, I personally believe that the three witnesses maintain their testimonies through their lives. And from a faithful perspective, you could say that I think a faithful uh, perspective is they saw what they said that they saw. They didn't deny it. And it was real. There were some real plates. There were real angels. And the whole thing is just like they described. That's a faithful perspective. What would be a counter uh, uh, perspective? How could you explain this movie, for instance, if you are a critic or someone who only believed in a natural uh, worldview. Well, I would say that I linked to Don Vogel's uh, series on YouTube, and I think that he offers a very good counter, uh, uh, I think he offers the best counter per perspective that I've come across. And he's, he postulates that Joseph Smith could have used hypnosis. In other words, he placed people into trance states in which they would be sub, um, susceptible to visionary experiences. And this was uh, honed from his years of treasure digging where there was incantations and spirits and, and things along those lines. Also, from a critical perspective, if Joseph Smith manufactured the plates out of a common tin or copper, he wouldn't be able to show them uncovered at first when he brought them home on September 27, 1827. But he would, if he had much more time later, a couple of years, so two and a half years later, he would be able to show them uncovered because by then he had put engravings on them. So I'll give you my testimony. My testimony remains that when it all comes down to it, the Book of Mormon remains a powerful book of scripture. Our next film <laughs> that we're going to be reviewing is The Lost Manuscript that was um, released in 1974. It depicts the trials of the Prophet Joseph Smith and his family, um, which they endured during the translation of the Book of Mormon, and Martin Harris's role in this translation of the Lost 116 Pages. If you made it, if you made it this far, drop me a like, drop me a comment, drop me a subscription. Come back again, and let's review The Lost Manuscript next time. So long. Mm -hmm.